Riverside, New Life East. Good to see you this morning. Why don't you go ahead and find your seats if you don't mind, if you're new with us. My name is Andrew. I'm the lead pastor here. And we're just so enthused that you're with us. We're so enthused about all the good things that God is doing already in this congregation. Uh, do you know, you might not know if you don't follow us on social media, uh, we had 282 people come to worship for our first preview service last Sunday, which is bananas. And I think we're at least at that, if maybe a little bit, a little bit more this morning. So I called Pastor Brady after the service last week and said, hey, great report. You know, we had all these people, et cetera, et cetera. It was just amazing. There's so much energy in the place. And he was over the moon about that and then said, you know, the big concern that I have for you guys with your launch Sunday. So we're three weeks, two weeks really now away from launch Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday. He said, my big concern is that you'll have 700 people show up for launch Sunday, 500 of which are new lifers and 200 of which are brand new. And those brand new people are going to come on in here and it's going to feel great to us that we filled the building up, but it won't feel great to them. And they'll feel like there isn't space for me here and I don't really feel like I can connect. And so these people that we've created this space for are going to hightail it out of here and go somewhere else or never come back. He said, I think that you guys need to launch not with one service, but with two services. And so we made, I know, right? It's so exciting. I told a lot of our staff and team when they decided to like help out with New Life East, I was like, just be prepared. This is going to be a wild and crazy ride. And so we're already making one of those decisions, which is awesome. So launch Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday is not going to be one service. It's going to be two services, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., full children's ministry. It's amazing. So that goes to Pastor Colin's point about volunteering and getting involved. Now we need you even more than we needed you before, all right? Kind of have to double up on our teams, um, but that's good. We've got great team leaders, and they're ready to receive you. So make sure to sign up uh, for a team. And again, you know, remember, we're not doing this, guys, for us. Pastor Brady said that when he was making the announcement at New Life North, that this is not about having a more convenient option for new lifers. This is about creating space so that those that don't have church family can have church family. The scripture says in Psalm 68 that God sets the lonely in families. So what we're doing is we're setting the table for people to come and be part of what God's doing here. So invite your friends and invite your neighbors and volunteer to be on a team and let's be ready to host people, receive people when they come. On uh, Super Bowl Sunday, that's the first little thing I had to say. Second thing I wanted to say is uh, part of that, you know, we just really feel like our mission on the east side of the city is to shepherd people well. And not just here, but in our homes throughout the week. And so as part of our launch, what I'm really looking for is people who can share the yoke with us from a pastoring people standpoint. We need to get groups going around here. And so I'm looking for folks who are not just... Uh, they're not just trying to pull together six or seven of their precious, best, closest friends and just have this nice little intimate group. I'm looking for people who want to throw the doors of their home open to those folks that need community. And so if you have any experience with group leadership whatsoever, if you've led groups in the past, if you feel like you have the gift of hospitality, if you want to share this aspect of our mission together, would you please do me a favor and email me? You can find my email address on the website and just let me know, hey, I heard the announcement on Sunday and I'm interested in finding out more about New Life East groups and I'll share a little bit more vision with you and then we'll work through kind of an application process and get you rolling with that. But we need people who can share the yoke with us and so please email me with that. Sound good? Yeah. Yeah? You know what's funny is the imbalance of the room here. I see people just kind of came in and they went plunk and then over here, everybody's feeling a little, a little we'll figure it out eventually. Our series that we're working through is called First Things, First Things. All of our congregations are doing this to start out the year. Just thinking through what are those habits that we embrace as believers that set us up, position us to not only receive the life of God, but transmit the life of God to the world. Last week I talked about the discipline of scripture. Uh, today I want to talk about the discipline of church, the habit of church. And so I'm going to be in Genesis 1 and then I'm going to in 2 and then I'm going to tie a few different texts together. But before we get there, let's just pause and acknowledge the presence of God, ready ourselves to receive the word of God. Don't you just love the Lord? We just acknowledge here and now, Jacob said, surely God was in this place and I wasn't aware of it but we're aware. 
we're aware of you, God, and we want to become more aware of you. We acknowledge that because the whole earth belongs to God, there's never been a time in our lives when we weren't standing on holy ground. But here and now, we want to take off our shoes and just say yes to you, become awed by you again. Lord, I pray that you would dazzle us this morning. If you are the living God, you're the God of surprise, and I pray that you would surprise us. I pray that you would fill our hearts with wonder upon wonder, that you would help us remember the goodness, the glory, the beauty of being called sons and daughters of the living God, the goodness, the glory, and the beauty of being called the family of God. Help us remember that this morning. We pray that the scriptures would speak. We pray that they would erupt in this place. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come and that with your righteous right hand, with your mighty arm, that you would tear down in us all that stands against you and all that stands against the purposes of God. And we pray that you would build a tabernacle for yourself inside of us individually and among us as a people. Grant that we're asking this morning. We pray that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said. Genesis 1, the writer of the book of Genesis says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You know it. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was, God saw that the light was, it was good. And the beautiful thing about reading through the creation narrative of Genesis 1 is that at every stage in the creation process, whatever God does, he does good. And he makes it, he makes it good. He gathered up the water under the sky And the scripture says in verse 10 that he saw that that was good. And then he brought dry land out and he saw that that was good. And then the land produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds. And God saw that was good. And he made the great lights, the sun and the moon and the stars to mark the seasons and the days and the times and the years. And God saw that was good. And then he filled the land and the water with living creatures. It was teeming with creatures. And God saw that it was good. Everything was good because everything God does is good and nothing that God does is, he doesn't make bad stuff. God only makes good stuff and God creates human beings and the human beings are good. And then we come to this moment in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree that's in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. And then the Lord God said, it is, wait, what? I mean, it's like all of a sudden the record screeches. The creation there, everything's good, good, good. Everything's good. God makes the land and the sky and the seas and the trees and the fields and the fish and the livestock and good. He's just good over everything. And then all of a sudden we get a pronouncement that something is not good. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. It's not good that a human being should be alone. That, that should cause us pause right then and there. That everything that God is making and everything that God is doing is good. And the first time we see no good in the Bible, it's when a human being is alone. Human beings were not made to be alone. We're not made to be lone rangers. We're not made to do this by ourselves. In fact, when God creates human beings, he doesn't just sort of create individual human beings and then kind of wind them up and set them going. But the scripture says in Genesis 1 and verse 26, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created what? Mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish and the birds and every living creature that moves along the ground. He creates human beings in his image and in his likeness. Now, certainly each one of us individually has the divine image stamped on us. 
Each one of us in some way is a reflection of the divine being. But if we're reading the Genesis text, right, then it's really not just human beings alone that image God, but it's humanity together that images God. That the divine image isn't just given to individuals, but the divine image is given to groups of people. It's really given to all humanity. And there's already a clue to the nature of God inside this text, isn't there? That God said, let us create mankind in our image and in our likeness. Well, Moses wrote better than he knew when he was writing this. Then in Christianity, we believe that God is not just a solitary being rattling around in the cosmos, but we believe that God is Father and the great G.K. Chesterton years ago said that God is a society. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity past to eternity future have always and are always and will always exist as a society of persons. God is a community. And when God creates human beings in his image and in his likeness, he doesn't just create individuals, but he creates them to mirror the divine life. And the divine life is... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the same way, human beings together mirror that image of God. My friend Daniel Grothy is sitting with us. Daniel, where are you? Can you wave? Daniel Grothy. Daniel Grothy has said this as good as anybody I think has ever said it, that community is not just God's idea, but community is God's identity. And when God makes us out of himself, he makes us for community. And calls us into community. In fact, when you start reading the scriptures, one of the things that you see is that the great visions of salvation that are cherished by the prophets are always communal in nature. Always communal in nature. Listen to the great text of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2. The prophet says, this is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the last days. So here's a vision of the end of all things. What will be when God gets the last word? What will be when death has been defeated? What will be when the kingdom has come in full? Isaiah describes it like this, that the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all the nations will stream into it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And the law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he will judge between the nations and he will settle disputes from many peoples and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore come descendants of Jacob let us walk in the light of the Lord do you see what God is saying here that the end of all things brothers and sisters is not a heaven of private individuals having their own kind of personal rapturous experience of God in the sweet by and by. But the end of all things, like where this story is headed, where the story is careening towards, is a moment when all nations and all peoples will stream into the temple of God, the mountain of the Lord for the worship of God. And the immediate impact of that is that all antagonism all division between them, every wall and every barrier that's been thrown up by sin, that that will be deconstructed so that the vision of Genesis may be realized. That they're fruitful and they increase in number and the divine image through humanity is expressed into the world. So when you ask the question, why is the habit of church important? It's because we're living ahead of time that vision of where the world is going. What will be when God, the triune God, is all in all is that we'll have a humanity where there is neither black nor white, Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, but God will be all and will be in all. That's, brothers and sisters, where the story is going. Paul wrote it like this in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul's whole missionary enterprise was to see this vision come to pass. Paul wrote, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by, by revelation, as I've already written briefly. And in reading this, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, 
which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. And here's the mystery. That through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members of one body, and sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, God does not just save us through the church, but God saves us into the church. The church is the ancients believed, the ancient church fathers believed is the ark of God's salvation, the place where God was working out his saving purposes. So when the power of God falls upon us, what it does is it draws us into the life of the church. The great Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it like this. He said that Christianity is nothing but community in Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ. And when we step into the church, when we practice church, what happens is our lives are changed. Our lives are transformed. One of my favorite moments that we embrace as the community of faith is that moment when we do child dedications. Such a beautiful moment. We have parents and families and friends gathering around these little ones. And what do we do? We take some oil and we rub it on our fingers and we smear it on the heads of those little babies. We make the sign of the cross and we plead the divine name over their lives. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We say this one belongs to Christ Jesus. That this is not just some individual that we happen to be associated with, but this is somebody who's been brought into the family of faith. And so what we're doing when we're praying over them is we're claiming them for our life together and for the kingdom of God, which happened to sit inside one another. And we plead the blood of Jesus over them and we claim the ancient promises over them. And then one of the best things that happens in the church is that we get to watch those little ones grow up. And you watch them run around here in church and they got smiles on their face and they're excited about being in church and they're being raised and nurtured and brought up in the church. What's happening to them? They're experiencing the power of belonging to the church. They grow up, they taste and see that the Lord is good and it never occurs to them to seek life somewhere else. I'm one of those kids who was brought up inside the church, dedicated when I was a little guy and baptized when... I was 10 and growing up in the church is one of the most beautiful things that can happen to you. Belonging to the church is one of the most beautiful things that can happen to you. As a little guy growing up in the church, I just remember like all of those people who were constantly encouraging me and comforting me and building me up. I mean, it's like this, uh, the church I grew up in was 700 or so people. So you have an extended family of 700 or so people that know who you are and they know your life story. And when you start acting like a twit, which is often, they pull you back on track. They go, that's not you. I know your mom and dad, and I watched you when you were dedicated and when you were baptized, and I've seen you in children's ministry, and that thing that you're doing over there, that's not you. This is who you are. And there are times that you chafe against it, you know? I remember being a kid, and sometimes I'd go home from school or I'd where, wherever, I'd wind up back at the house, and my parents would go, you know, we heard about da 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 Oh, I heard of, who'd you hear about that from? Well, so-and-so told so-and-so, told so-and-so, told so-and-so. Church! <laughs> but that's what it does, right? Like it anchors you in who you are. It anchors you in being. It, it helps you remember. Like it, every single time that you start wandering off into the far country, all of a sudden you find that the church is there going, Hi! You don't go there. You don't, you don't need to do that. And you have that moment like the prodigal son happened where you come back to your senses and you go, what am I doing living in the far country? You, you wake up again to your identity as one of those who's been called out of darkness and into the marvelous light. There's somebody in the people of God comes to you and says, you don't need to be doing that and you don't need to be acting in that way. And also you have more in front of you than you realize. How many times, think about your own lives, those of you that have walked in the church for any length of time that your life just felt like it was in shambles, it was falling apart and somebody showed up with a prophetic word for you. Or, hey, I was praying for you this morning and the Lord gave me this image for you and I was, this is how I was praying. And you go, that was what I needed. It's the thing that like picks you up. What happens, brothers and sisters, when we're in the church and we practice the church and we throw ourselves into the life of the local church, we find that the powers of the age to come wash over us and renew us. I mean, if you've been in the church for a long time, sometimes you take for granted what happens here. I've got news for you. 
this doesn't happen. Like what we experience here does not happen outside the walls of the church. The way that people congregate in the world is they congregate at raves and clubs and Broncos games and weird stuff like that, you know. <laughs> These sort of bizarre experiences, the music pumping, gung, 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 right? We got to crash into each other and sort of experience human beings. Or you go to the Broncos game and the only thing that you share in common is this terrible team playing football in front of you. And every once in a while they do something good and you high five and the person next to you, but you really don't want to get involved in their lives. The church is so unique. Guys, we would have never been in a room together apart from the mercy of Jesus Christ. But we've been called by Jesus Christ out of darkness and into the marvelous light. And what we do then is we start opening our lives to each other. We start confessing our sins to each other and exposing our vulnerabilities. And we find that as people pray for us, we're healed and we're lifted up and we're blessed. And we find that the worst things about us no longer need to be definitional about us. Because we're covered by the mercy of God, the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord. And so we're emboldened to live transparently. We don't need to hide. We don't have any secrets. We don't need to have secrets because everything's been touched by the mercy. It's been blessed by the mercy. Why do we practice church? Because we need this. Why do we practice church? It's because we're desperate without it. Because I need you. And you need me. And we need each other. Paul says that what God has done in the church is that he's deposited grace in each person. That each person has this divine deposit of supernatural power. That when it breaks open and starts flooding out to other people, that we find that that grace of God, it wakes us up. It makes us alive. We all in different ways are carriers of the breath of God. And when that breath comes out of us to other people, we find that like in Genesis 2, the dust was put together and God breathed into the the dust nostrils, the breath of life, and the man stood up. What happens is we encounter one another and we stand up, we wake up. We remember who we are. But it's not just for us, is it? The power that exists in the church is not just for the church. Paul writes this, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. Paul is talking about what it looks like to have a sense of decorum in the church, doing everything in a decent, a decent and an order kind of fashion. He's talking about tongues and prophecy in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and he says that tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers but for believers. And so if the whole church comes together and everybody is speaking in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in. You see, Paul presupposes that the gathering of the faithful is a public gathering in some way and that people are going to wander in because they're interested in what's happening inside the church. And he says, so if these unbelievers or inquirers come in and they see y'all speaking in tongues, aren't they going to say that you're crazy? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, They are convicted of sin and they are brought under judgment by all. Verse 25, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. And so they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Like y'all are together and you're worshiping and you're praying and you're prophesying and the word is being preached. And all of a sudden, those powers of the age to come that are washing over you all, they somehow wash over me as an unbeliever. And I find that something is breaking down in me and something is opening up in me. And the secrets of my heart, all of a sudden, I can't help it. I just start confessing my sins. Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. I find that it all starts coming out. And I realize that God is really among you. And I want some of that. That's what happens in the church. That we don't just take our life and kind of hide it over here and we have our favorite people and everything is nice and wonderful and it's a, the church is not the Jesus club. The church is that slice of humanity that the powers of the age to come have fallen on. And then they're taking that and they're flinging the doors of their life wide open and they're saying, come in here, taste and see that the Lord is good. The last year and a half or so in our congregation, one of my favorite stories that's happened is we've had, we had this lady wander in. Uh, our, we have these public gatherings it's like worship, women's ministry, Sunday mornings. Our life together is open to people. We had a young woman wander in. She was in an abusive relationship and she did not know the Lord. And she came to our gathering. She was hungry for God. And she found that something started to stir her 
And so she approached one of the pastors after the service and said, this is my life and this is what's going on at the time. She was living in her car on the run from this abusive relationship. And what did the church do? The church said, oh, you belong with us. Like that stuff that's going on with you, we've got you now. So you get in here. And one of the families in our church took this young woman in, decided to give her a place to stay and covered her and blessed her. And as she began opening her heart up to the Lord, Jesus Christ planted himself in her life. And we watched as the weeks and the months went by that when she'd come into church, she wasn't coming with her head down, but she'd come with her eyes up and her shoulders back and a skip in her step. The God that we worship in Jesus Christ is the God who said to the ancient Israelites that I broke the bars of your yoke and I enabled you to walk with heads held high. In the church when we experience the goodness of God, that's what happens to us. Is that Jesus dignifies us. And we find that we're able to walk with heads held high in this woman recently, just a couple months ago, was baptized, tears streaming down her face. And there was a mob of about two dozen people around her who have walked with her through her stuff. And tears are streaming down their faces. Why? Because God is really, truly, actually among us. What does it mean, guys, for us to be a congregation on the east side of the city? It means that we're sharing life together in such a way that God not only transforms us, but he flings the doors of our life wide open so that the world can be transformed. That's what we're doing here. That's what this is all about. And you look around all of these houses around here, a sliver at best of them are connected to the life of the local church. We are not here for convenience sake. We're here for them. In the same way that Christ Jesus did not walk among us for convenience sake. He didn't take a body because he was bored. <laughs> we're not doing this because we're bored. There are other things to do with our time and our money. We're doing this because people need to be reached. Because God cares for people. Because the Son of God came for people. Because the entire mission of the church is, it's people. That's what we're here for. So in the same way that Jesus Christ opened up his life to us, what we're doing is we're opening up our life to others. And we're going to watch them change.